So today we will mostly talk about uh, point defects. Specifically, we will start with the question of vacancies. And we will start with the simplest um, model. So these are the vacancies in, a met metal crystals, in metal crystals. So what we are talking about here are individual atoms. They are all identical, and these are metallic atoms. We will talk about more complex structures, for example, ionic crystals, when we have different atoms in the material. But we are starting with a discussion about metals. It's the simplest way. So uh, we mentioned that in this particular case, you can have, for example, a vacancy or a self-interstitial point defect. What that simply means, again, vacancy would be one atom that is removed from the crystalline perfect structure. And the self-interstitial would be an interstitial atom of the same type as the, uh, as the host crystal. Right? So for example, again, if this was iron, the self-interstitial would be an additional uh, iron atom that is introduced into this uh, matrix. And again, why they are called defects is because locally you disrupt the periodicity of the crystal. Right? So the atoms, if you remove this particular atom and form a vacancy, these, uh, the atoms surrounding that vacancy will be deformed from their original position, meaning that locally the periodicity that we define in that crystal is perturbed. So this is why they're called defects, right? <coughs> the same thing for interstitial atoms, because you're introducing this atom, the atoms surrounding that particular atom have to be deformed from their original position. And you can then actually quantify what that strain is by knowing what is the atom size, etc. You can quantify what is the magnitude of the deformation. Okay, so one important thing that we have to learn, and I would say that this is the most important take-home message of today's lecture, is that the vacancies and other point defects are third thermodynamically stable. What that means, again, at a given temperature, there will be a certain concentration of point defects that is equilibrium concentration of point defects, right? And uh, here, I will, when we talk about some of the concepts in thermodynamics, I will follow the notation from Allen and Thomas' book. I think that Professor Rano mentioned today that, for example, in the problem set, you will have similar concepts um, introduced from the structure and from the thermo. And although perhaps small uh, notation might be different, the concepts are exactly identical, right? So I will just follow the notation from Allen and Thomas for your simplicity. But the main point here is that you're looking at the particular crystal. <coughs> and what you're trying to identify is what are the relative thermodynamic uh, properties that have to be at equilibrium at that particular temperature. And you know from thermodynamics is that what you need to do is that you have to have the thermodynamically, uh, that you have to uh, minimize the Gibbs free energy of a material. And let me just remind you that the Gibbs free energy is simply enthalpy H minus T where T is the temperature times the entropy, okay? So this will be the main, main important uh, function that we will consider today. So we will try to understand what is the, how this behaves as a function of temperature and how from that we can calculate the equilibrium concentration of point defects. Okay, so um, we are actually interested in the change of the Gibbs free energy. We can, that we can change, uh, we can write as delta G is equal change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in the entropy. And what that means, uh, just to give you an intuitive understanding of what you are doing right now. You, for example, imagine that you have a perfect crystal, right? All of the atoms are positioned in a crystalline structure according to the symmetry and other considerations that we calculated, right? So if you want to form a vacancy, there is a certain energy that is required to move that atom and form a vacancy, right? And that will be captured in the enthalpy form uh, 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 part of this equation. So if I want to take, for example, this atom here and move it to the surface, so this atom has to end up somewhere, right? And when we think about the formation of the vacancies, they have to diffuse somewhere outside of the, on the surface of the material. And this will leave a vacancy in the material. So there is a certain energy that is required to do that, right? So Th that energy will be proportional to the number of the vacancies that you have to form, right? If I have to form one vacancy or two, in the second case, I would need to have more twice as energy that is required to move that, right? So that will be captured in the change of the enthalpy. On the other hand, the entropy form uh, in this particular case comes from the mixing component. What that means is that if you have an n number of atoms, there is a certain number of arrangements that they can take, right? 
But if suddenly you start to form one uh, vacancy, you're increasing the number of the positions that these atoms can uh, take by one, right? And you're changing the entropy component of that. So our aim today will be to quantify these two components, enthalpy and the entropy, and how they depend or do not depend on the temperature. And then their equilibrium will give us the, the equilibrium number of vacancies that will equilibrate these two components. Right, so there is energy penalty uh, that you have to introduce to form a vacancy, and at the same time, the entropy component is changing. Okay, so uh, because what I mentioned is that the enthalpy component depends on the number of the vacancies, so small n will be the number of vacancies. in the material. So the enthalpy change when you form certain number of vacancies will be proportional to that number n. And it will depend on the energy which we will label as Hf, delta Hf. So this is a simply energy that is required to form one vacancy. So the enthalpy change will be simply the number of the vacancies times the energy that is required to form one vacancy. <coughs> the entropy component will have two components. So the entropy component will have a vib vibrational component, which we'll label as delta S vibrational, plus change in the entrop entropy due to the mixing. So just to explain you what that means, is that if, for example, if you remove one atom from a crystalline structure and move it to the surface, the vibrational properties of the, of the individual atoms will slightly change because there is a missing atom, right? So this will be captured in this vibrational component of the entropy. The second component, the mixing entropy, is the one that I described. So simply if you remove an atom and place it on the surface, you're increasing the number of the configurations that these atoms within the material can have. So that will change the, 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 this uh, mixing component of the entropy. So we will see that this particular component, the, the entropy, mixing component of the entropy, is the one that is really mostly dominant that will tell you what is the number of the vacancies that you have to have. Okay. So um, from the thermo, you can actually calculate and you can uh, understand what is this entropy of mixing. So the entropy of the mixing <coughs> can be written as k times logarithm of n plus n over n times n, okay? Where again, n is the number of the atoms. And n, small n is the number of vacancies. So you are simply uh, calculating what is the possibility of arranging the atoms and vacancies in different configurations. And if you have this system, you can think about this as, for example, mixing two elements. Here we are mixing vacancies and atoms. So the entropy of mixing can be expressed by this equation. Yes? What's k? Oh, it's the Boltzmann constant. Okay. So we can actually take the uh, approximation that uh, logarithm of can be expressed as n times logarithm of n minus n. So then I can change the, uh, then I can rewrite the change in the Gibbs free energy as n times, we know uh, that this is the enthalpy of the formation for one vacancy, minus t times s vibrational minus kt, and I'm just rewriting this equation in this following form, n plus n, ln of n plus n, minus n, ln of n, minus n, ln of n. So I just rewrote the equation from the previous slide, introducing all of the components that we defined, and using this particular approximation for the logarithm. So what we have to do is basically we have to find the minimum of this. So we are trying to figure out where is this change in the Gibbs free energy as a function of n equal to zero. And we are finding the minimum. So the second derivative of this has to be a positive number. <coughs> so when you do the calculation, and uh, again, it's a simple calculation, and I encourage you to do this at home, you do get the equilibrium concentration of vacancies. So what this e equation here tells you is, so again, small n is the concentration of the vacancies for a given number of the atoms. 
and you see that it depends on two components. So this fiddle C can be negligible, so this can be approximated as one. And it depends on the enthalpy energy of formation. So it's mostly driven, so it is temperature dependent, and it depends on the enthalpy, enthalpy component of the vacancy formation. Okay? So again, if you know this property, and this is the property of a material, of our specific atom within the material, you can calculate what is the equilibrium concentration of vacancies or any other types of point defects at a given temperature. Okay? So this is a very uh, simple equation and we will try to apply it and just try to understand what is happening, but just to show you in a graphic form what we just did. So there are different components of this Gibbs free energy that we calculated. So this is the enthalpy change, which is linear. This is this mixing component of the entropy, and this was the vibrational component, which is also linear, but it goes in the opposite direction from the enthalpy component. And when you sum them all together, the Gibbs free energy has this general form, and for a given temperature, these curves will shift slightly, and you're trying to find where is the minimum, what is the minimum point, what is the concentration of the vacancies where this uh, uh, Gibbs free energy is reaching the minimum. <coughs> right? So we derive the equation and now you have a visual understanding of what that actually means. But the main message that we are trying to convey is that again, the entropy of mixing is responsible for the spontaneous existence of the point defects at equilibrium. So again, what that means is that at a given temperature, the finite temperature, let's say at room temperature, there is, will be a specific concentration and it will be driven by the entropy of the mixing. And the exact value of that will depend on the enthalpy of the formation, which is the magnitude of that enthalpy component delta HF. Okay? So if this delta HF is a larger number, you will have less vacancies because it's more difficult to form a vacancy. Okay? So I will give you a couple of um, uh, examples. Um, and <coughs> Um, and uh, we will also learn that these particular types of properties or uh, concentration of the point defects that are temp temperature dependent can be shown in this so-called Arrhenius law uh, uh, way. So for example, if you have this particular equation that we just derived, you can see that the concentration, which we will again, this will be the concentration of the vacancies, which is simply the number of the vacancies relatively to the number of the vacancies plus the number of the atoms. It's an exponential function that, is, that goes as a function of one over t, and there is an activation energy component, okay? So any type of a process that has this particular dependence on the temperature, where there is an activation energy for a process to happen, and that activation energy is fixed, and it, the, the, the concentration or a property depends on the temperature, it's called Arrhenius law. So you will see that in material science, there are many, many processes like diffusion and other processes that simply follow this particular law. And again, what they all have in common is that there is an activation energy. You have to invest a certain amount of energy to initiate a process. And as a consequence, the magnitude of that pro property, let's say concentration of the defects, is then temperature dependent, okay? So this is a very, very famous law. Uh, you will f face this very often in material science, so it's very, good to understand what, what are the properties of these uh, processes. And, um, so we look at this a, li a little bit in more detail. So again, this is the concentration <coughs> of the vacancies. And if I plot this, <coughs> so if I plot the concentration of the vacancies um, as a function of the temperature, this would be an exponential function, right? higher temperature, the, uh, the, the, I would have more vacancies for a given material. If I know what is the energy that is required for, uh, to calculate one, uh, to form one vacancy, you can calculate exactly what is the curvature of this exponential function, which is great. But there is a better way to show this. Actually, when you take the logarithm of this, and if you plot now this graph as a logarithm, of the concentration of the vacancies as a function of one over temperature, this will be a linear function, right? So again, if I go left on this graph, this is the higher temperature, right? One over T is lower. The concentration of the vacancies is higher, 
But now this dependence of the logarithm of the concentration of the vacancies is a function of 1 over t, is a linear function. Okay? And it becomes much easier to, to, to show the trends in the materials. It becomes, uh, the analysis becomes easier. And it also, if you have different competing processes that have the same type of Arrhenius behavior, you, it, will, it is much easier to understand what is their activation energy. Because the slope of this graph, what is the slope? Look at the, the equation. It's very simple, right? So you're, on the left-hand side, you have logarithm of the concentration. On the right-hand side, you have minus q over k kt. So what will be the slope of this line here? Minus q over, uh, 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 over k. <coughs> OK, so this is Arrhenius plot. So Arrhenius plot in general is any type of a plot where you show the logarithm of a certain property as a function 1 over t. And if it shows 1 over t behavior, uh, if it shows linear behavior, it means that there is a gain. It follows this Arrhenius law, and you show this as Arrhenius plot. And the power of this representation is that from the slope itself, you can exactly see what is the activation energy. So if you're comparing two curves that are shown in the Arrhenius plot, you can say immediately which one is more uh, uh, easy to produce or which one is, uh, requires more energy, okay? So, for example, if you form, if you have two materials <coughs> with different energies of the vacancy formation, you can, from their slopes, immediately say in which material it's easier to form vacancies. 